Are you full of health and wellness information yet struggling to implement into your daily life? Or do you have your health sorted out but struggling to integrate it with your other areas of your life? We've surveyed a number of Wellness Couch fans and recognize that this is the biggest challenge that most of you face in daily life. How do you turn your knowledge into action in a lifestyle? Enter the Wellness Breakthrough. For three days and two nights in February, eight of your Wellness Couch favorites are gathering in Melbourne for one incredible event, and we just have three spots left. Entry to the Wellness Breakthrough is by application only. To apply, simply go to thewellnessbreakthrough.com. And apologies in advance if you apply and we're all sold out. Wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, featuring your hosts, Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is sponsored by Australian Bushflower Essences. So if you haven't heard of these, these are flower essences similar to the bark. So the bark flower essences are European flowers, whereas the Australian bush flower essences are literally from our motherland, Mm. so from Australia. And when we say a flower essence, it's it's really particular. It's a very, very, um, I'm going to say a hippie kind of concept. So an essence, like a crystal essence or a homeopathic or a bush flower essence, is a vibrational medicine. So it's the vibration of that thing in a liquid format that when we take it within our our energy and our bodies, it shifts an energy within us. So it meets a vibration and it kind of flicks that around. And that's really how essential oils work too. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Australian bushflower essences, so bushflowers themselves are created, they're intuitively known. So someone, the creator of, of um, bark, as much as Australian bushflowers, have intuitively received guiding messages about what the healing powers of, it, of each of these plants or flowers are. And it's the first morning's dew at a particular time in the day, at a particular time of the year, that's created this perfect transition of the energy and vibration of that flower into what we call a mother essence. How gorgeous. And that's then diluted and transmitted like a homeopathic into a vibrational medicine, which then we can use for healing purposes. Mm. So Australian bush flower essences are really fantastic for us to to use if we're Australian because part of that is vibrating on the land that we're Mm. living in Mm. and with. And they do a whole range from, you know, skin, skin care, sprays for your room and your space through to essences that you actually take internally to shift and heal imbalances. So they were another collaborator with us at our retreat and they gifted each woman some skincare to take home and we used some of their love system um cards so they have intuitive cards like a guiding deck but they're for each of their flower essences. So we use those during our retreat mm. as well which was really beautiful. So again, have a look at those if you're interested in a vibrational medicine. But on to today's podcast, Bridget, you're going to kick it off for us. So we're talking today about dealing with conflict because we can't get rid of conflict, hey? Like it's part of uh, it's uh, part of life. coming up, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends. I mean, I'm not feeling like I'm getting a lot at the moment, but maybe I'm just, I don't know why. But Which is funny because I am, and I would say I previously have not. Like, yeah. have not. So we're going to get heavy and deep in this one. We invite conflict. We invite it unconsciously. Know, what is that? And we do it because there's something for us to learn about ourselves. Nothing more, nothing less. We, we'll also, that's not true actually, there is a lot more and a lot less, but we will be attracting conflict for various reasons. So conflict might come as a result of um, expecting other people to value what you value, so expecting them to live outside what's true for them. Mm-hmm. So you're then imposing what you think somebody should do on them and they're retaliating naturally to that imposition of order um, or kind of value um, or you're expecting yourself to live outside what's true for you and so you'll create conflict within yourself or conflict with other people who are trying to help you to get back into your own authenticity. Mm. So if you're kind of suddenly turned your life upside down and you're valuing something totally different and your family are challenging you on that, then that's where another source of conflict. So conflict is a feedback to help you get back into congruency with what's true for you or what's or, you know or, or to help you own part of yourself that you're not owning so you'll invite the conflict to get you to love that part mm-hmm. so there's something that I was reading I've been going back through a lot of what I'm studying and there's something that jumped out of me which was this passage that said your life's pain is proportional to the volatility of your perceptions so what that means is pain let's talk about pain in terms of conflict if you're 
Perceptions are volatile, which means you've got massive highs, massive lows, highly, highly disparate emotional feelings happening all the time. You know, you're just not really grounded at all. Then you'll have a greater perception of pain because the pain is a feedback to help you to equilibrate those perceptions which are way out of whack. Now, the pain is a compensation to break your addiction with an idealized version, idealized version of yourself. So you have some idealized version of a certain way that you should be. So you, maybe you need to be always happy or never sad or super successful and, and financially astute or really, really one-sided, dedicated mother who doesn't show their child any anger or frustration. That's an idealized self. It's not a whole self because it's an idealized version of yourself that's a fantasy. You can't have that. Mm. It's not possible. You have to own the two parts. Um, and so the pain is a compensation to try, and, to try and get you to break your addiction to a fantasy self that you're creating. Does that make sense? No, I really get it. I'm just really enjoying where you're going with it. Yeah, you're really just sitting with that. So I'm just going to say, we did just have to stop because yeah, yeah, so. Bridget's giving me a, Shh. yeah, you're just sitting with it. Like, oh, yeah, I can do, because I had this piece of paper that I had notes written on and all I can think about the whole time you're talking yeah, is, yeah, so. where's my piece of paper? <laughs> so I have the piece of paper now. We're all good. We can move forwards. All right, Bridget. I do really get what you're saying. I do. Yeah. I just want to bring that back to conflict though. So have you got notes? Like I get what you're saying in terms of when we're living on perhaps there's conflict coming in and we're having emotions that are kind of pinging us all over the place, that that's happening because we're not actually seeing the other side or the gifts in why that's happening or creating the learnings or the healing out of that to bring mm. us back into balance, right? That's what you're saying is yeah, yeah. we're having those hugely irrational moments because they're the things that get us to pay attention to where there's imbalance or a lack of um, equal perception, yeah. right? I think probably the easiest way to, to focus on it is to use a real life example. So do you have an example that we can unpack, that we can, that we can... Jeez, you're putting me on the spot. Because <laughs> I think otherwise it's kind of abstract, right? Like these are abstract concepts unless we can apply them to a situation to see how the conflict has come about. Well, because... I've had a few conflicts lately, so but I just don't know how to make that. Uh, I don't know how to how to characterize it. Yeah, I guess I guess the thing is, you know, conflict comes in more when we're not when when we're trying to kind of not have conflict. It's almost like it's going to breed conflict. Okay, well, let's just talk about the conflict that maybe happened most recently for me. Pre me getting sick, actually, maybe this is poignant because remember I said to you, I'd had there's this um. It's always going to be at school, isn't it? There's this child at school that my eldest son has had a few issues with over the last, you know, nine months. And I'd been really workshop, we had been really workshopping with, with my son Heath, how to work with that and how to respond appropriately and la, 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 la. massive amounts of work going into that at home. Mm. So I had in my head, well, we're not really going to be having a friendship outside of school. We just have to work on, and he plays in the basketball team too, how um, my child handles himself in those situations. Because we're always going to be working with and coming against people in our lives that we don't like. Yeah. But we still have to, one, take the learnings out of it, yeah. but two, figure out how to maintain our balance, hold our space, be ourselves, yeah. and act with... Um, Grace and... Yeah. You know, just, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, this mum, I knew had hit a couple of other mums up for playdates and it had been really awkward and difficult and la la. And these mums had acquiesced and gone, oh, yeah, all right, even though they didn't really want to have this playdate and la la. <laughs> and when these mums are going through this pain and they're discussing it with me, I'm saying to them, well, I wouldn't do that. I would just be boundaried. <laughs> I would just say, here's my boundary. I don't wish to do that. And I wouldn't say it nastily. It would just be like, look, thanks. Here we go. So, of course, that opportunity arose for me, didn't it? Yeah. I got called on that. <laughs> I wonder, too, like, as you, yes, because you're saying this, was there an element of, like, pride in that? Like, oh, totally. Yeah, right. Because I had really been working on I really got this concept of uh, wholesome, healthy people and seductresses are boundaried. They mm. know their edges and they feel safe to let go and release into feeling and seduction because they're safe in their boundaries. Mm -hmm. They know that the second someone crosses those, you're going to snap, in comes the temptress and you're going to snap those back in. Yeah. And because you're so safe in knowing how protected your boundaries are, mm. you're so safe to let go. So this is perfect, right? Because this is just adding another layer of as to why we create conflict. Because before I talked about it as 
expecting yourself to live outside your values or you expecting other people to um, live in yours. This is another dynamic again. So you were sitting in pride around how you would handle a situation. Oh, how I've been just owning my boundaries. And you, and you just, <laughs> you know, and but pride also, like pride is an inflated sense of self. So if you're proud about something, you're going to attract something to cut you down. Yeah. And cutting you down is the next step. Do you want to talk about it? Well, you forced me to. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this mum then texted me text me. I want to see whether you think texting is a worthwhile conflict situation. (laughs) And, um, you know, asked for a play date with my son. And I thought, look, I could play the easy card and go, oh, look, we're just really busy this side of Christmas. Oh, oh, no time. But the thing is, it's always going to keep coming up. Yeah, I get that. And I knew in my essence that it was never going to happen. Mm. So why not just be authentic and honest with love but authentic and honest in here's, here's the line in the sand. Being comfortable with saying no. Like owning, Being comfortable owning with saying, no. Owning my no, exactly. And I talk the talk, so like the preaching podcast, I need to walk that, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I very, very diplomatically wrote a text back to her that was, you know, thanks so much. Checked in with my feelings like I'm feeling really awkward um, saying this and there's, you know, no easy but Being really authentic with where I was sitting with it. Yeah. Um, you know, my son's really happy to be friends and have a, a, you know, really great working relationship in school and in sport. He just really doesn't want to do a play date. Mm -hmm. So thanks, you know, thanks very much, but you know, see you around or whatever it was. And she had such an intense hurricane whirlwind. I didn't know what was coming my way Mm -hmm. response to me drawing my line in the sand Mm -hmm. that it was intense, man. She has just gone off the Richter chart and she's ripped her son out of the basketball team and she's taken herself out of the parenting team. Mm. And we had a twilight sports kind of, she's bad mouthing me to everyone that mm. will listen. She's engaged the teachers and the principal. She's then, um, bad mouthing my child in the classroom the next morning, which then gets your mama, mama, which bear then instincts. got my mama bear like <laughs> flaring up like nobody's business. <laughs> And, um, like it just went on. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was sitting there going, Oh my freaking God. And look, at and, and, you know, part of me was fine and, and okay, but I was thinking in my head, why, why, why? is this conflict coming my mm-hmm. way when I've, I've just in inverted commas drawn a boundary and a line, but this serves mm-hmm. me as much as her, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I was constantly checking in about, well, okay, there's this huge thing that's happened. But the funny thing is I wasn't having a huge emotional reaction other than the mama bear mummies yeah. energy. Yeah. For myself personally, I wasn't having a huge reaction to the conflict that was mm. coming my way because I felt completely grounded, authentic, and comfortable in the boundary that I'd set mm. and in the way in which I'd set it. Yeah, yeah. So there was nothing in that for me to feel guilty or shameful or wrong or mm. upset about because I was really rooted and grounded when I had – drawn that line yeah so anyway I let it go but then then wouldn't you know it that weekend that's when we all got sick so my three kids and then me were like down each day bang another one would go to the point where I wasn't at school for a whole week so which is like never happens so it was almost a perfect storm because I wanted an out. I didn't mm. want to deal with seeing this mum every single morning and drop off and pick up. Yeah. And guess what? I didn't see, have see to. We got illness. sick instead, <laughs> which was horrendous. So clever though, right? But yeah. <laughs> so and I'm saying to Bridget, I don't know why we're so sick. Yeah. And then I was like, Bridget goes, well, how did it serve you? Da-da-da-da. And I went, oh my God. I didn't have to go to school. I didn't have to deal with it. Yeah. But the the new the new dimension of this that I didn't get in the first time you told me was how the pride that you'd that you'd had and that this is potentially the universe balancing you out to temper the pride around around you being comfortable with setting boundaries and you you saying that you would just say, say the no. Because the thing is there's always consequences, right? And other people aren't going to be able to all be able to see your side of the story. And so this is played out, and yes, okay, her actions aren't particularly wise. They are a little bit erratic and emotional, but that's also a feedback for you to temper sometimes, and all of us temper our pr- pride around the things that we really value too. Because I can think back as you're explaining this story of myself in early motherhood. I'd researched everything. I knew all the answers. My way was the right way, and those 
families who were subjecting their baby to Johnson and Johnson stuff that was going to be toxic to their bodies were wrong. And I created so much inner conflict in myself with those, with those kinds of attitudes and conflict in terms of being able to build meaningful, vulnerable relationships Mm. with those women that really made me put up a wall. Mm. And that was a, my own intuition trying to wake me up to my imbalance. And I don't, I didn't see it then. It's only with hindsight that I can see it now, but that everything's a feedback. And this playing out for you was just a feedback for you. It wasn't right or wrong. Mm. And it served because it also served you for helping you to wake up to your own perceptions. It served the people around other mothers to have, to be more empowered to say no. Or not, since they saw the fallout. <laughs> <laughs> I really do think it gave them permission to, though. To, though, yeah. I do, on some level, think that, and possibly for this mum, too, what if she's never had anyone say no say to her no. before? Yeah. How does that serve her? Because the, when you get addicted to a support, you disown rejection and you won't, you won't allow, your, you'll unconsciously do everything you can to avoid rejection, but the rejection is what helps you to grow. You know, it helped. You can, can you imagine the, the testosterone and the energy and the kind of buoyancy that she would have got from that, those feelings of anger? Can you imagine how that would have um, connected her to her son because she felt her son was being challenged? Like that would yeah, have enriched their connection. So that absolutely served her. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. She would have found who her tribe was at school and got yeah, more. Yeah, she would have had tighter connections with her tribe. Yeah, because yeah, she, just, just like you did. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, you know, there's there's always that kind of jostling going on and when we can see when we're in it how it's serving us and we can move through it with more consciousness mm. and take the lessons from it as opposed to it always being somebody outside of us to blame. Mm. Mm. So balancing my pride, hey? Yeah. Damn pride. <laughs> and I thought I was being so grounded in my boundaries. I'm hilarious. But I think, you know, anything that... And, and it's like that idea that just when you think that you've got something nailed, you'll also get something right in there to challenge you on it. Yes. Because just to be sure, just to be sure that you... Are you really sure you really know this? Well, I really do now. <laughs> <laughs> but how great, though, because it's, it's got you to be clear on, on that is important for you. And also how that you know, it served your kids, you know, they, for them to see that you stood your ground and that you stood for what was important to you and that you were willing to, to deal with the fallout, Mm. you know, not just people pleased to keep the peace Mm. because you people pleased to keep the peace and you, and you have this, you know, illusion of external peace around you and you create inner turmoil because you're, there's the balance, isn't it? The inner conflict because you're trying to to create the outer peace peace. on the outside. Yeah. That's profound, Mm. isn't it? Yeah. I just wanted to jump back on also this. Did you have something else you wanted to add no, before I jumped you, on? No, you jump on. So this mimesma temptress kind of energy, because I've been working a lot with that. And if you've seen the posts on Facebook or on Instagram, you'll see that. I've been working a bit on that lately was because I, that's still the one part of me that feels very, um, I don't know, Neanderthal-ish. Yeah. That, you know, you could just about do anything with me and I would find a way with empathy or with my skilled kit to really kind of roll with it yeah but you do it to my kids and I am like lose my brain yeah total conniption yeah angry fiery woman comes out (laughs) and it's not pretty so just like what this woman did right yeah that's true actually so what was she reflecting to you about you oh that's really true Bridget good I didn't say that before I'm totally gonna sit with that Yeah. yeah totally and so I had really been judging this side of myself because I've had a few incidences in the last probably month where that's happened and I've just had this spurt of it and yes it's served in the end because I've gotten what I want or set the boundary or you know whatever but then in the process there's these huge feelings that afterwards I feel quite shameful about the way that I behaved or how I went about it mm. and I really wanted to flip that so I wanted to look at that in terms of the only way to really give in to the feminine is to let her have her way with you. And mm. the only way to be safe enough to do that is to know that you are protected and safe to do that. Yes. So we've talked before about how do you make your sexy safe? Well, this is it, right? Mm. You can't just be sexy safe in the light. I'm okay to wear whatever I want and put on makeup. You have to be sexy in the dark too that's mm. safe. Mm. So the temptress, the seductress, is as much the depth of her emotion as she is the height of pleasure. Yeah. And you can't have the height and the ecstasy of pleasure unless you're willing to feel the ferocity and the depth of the life, death, life cycle, yes. right? Yeah. So how do I love the her ferocity 
as opposed to wanting to cut it off. Mm. Because as soon as I want to cut it off, I'm disowning it. And it's going to, one, come up more, which is right what's been happening. Yeah, yeah. And two, it's going to also cut off its polar opposite at the other end in the yeah, light. Yeah, yeah. So how does it serve me, this mimesma, this this mother bear ferocity of nature? And how do I love her more? What does she bring to my life? So I, if you saw, I created a, an altar. So I did an altar to my dark temptress and I looked at... So the, the temptress is the opposite of the, the seductress. So she's the one who is going to get you in a really ferocious kind of dark way. She is, I suppose, the seductress is all about what is seducing you and it all comes from a light and a feeling. The temptress is the manipulation, the movement of energy mm. to gain power and purpose, I suppose, which can be in the light too. Mm. So if I were to work, walk into you know, an amazing monastery and there was a room dedicated just to my dark, ferocious goddess, Mm. what would I have in that room on that altar? What would honour her depth and her boundaries and her ability to trust that she's safe all of the time, knowing Mm. that she can protect herself even when she's incredibly vulnerable, that that Mm. never goes away, it's always there. Because the only way for me to be able to give in totally to seduction is to know that I'm totally safe. Yeah, yeah. And that's her role. Mm. And if you step on her toes, well, look out because she's going to bite your head off. Mm. Mm. And loving that instead of shaming, blaming and wanting to suppress it. Yeah. And, I mean, you're shaming and blaming and wanting to suppress that because you perceive sometime in your past that that kind of behaviour was detrimental to you or those around you. So that's why the shame keeps coming up. That's why that button keeps Mm. being pushed. And it's a common one for most people, you know, that we think that we shouldn't have outbursts like that. But that's really a social con- social conditioning, you know, that this is the right way to behave and that's the wrong way to behave. That's and, right. You know, we're, growing, we're, we're told certain ways that are acceptable and unacceptable. And so that's, that's pushing that for you. And it's about, okay, well, I mean, you can look at it a number of different ways. You can go in and do exactly what you said, like find how all of that, you know, serves you just as much. So as how it. does the temptress serve? Yeah. So why is she there in the first place? So what are the boundaries that are being stepped on that mm. she's wanting to make you go, Row, bring yeah. that back in or you step back, buddy? And so why is she there for the first place for you? Why has she come up? And what, what was the trigger? I mean, what for was you, the trigger? So you for know, the trigger for me is my kids. Your yeah. kids. And, you know, your yeah. kids are – and, I mean, ask any mother – somebody you don't get between a mother and a child mm. it's it's like a bio, biological evolutionary switch gets flicked mm. you know for that pro- for the protection for the protector you know to 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 behave the way that you do yeah so i mean there's two ways i really want to talk about uh, that in the way that you and i had discussed it but also it's to start off with is just loving her so what yeah, yeah why is she there and how does she serve you does she get your needs met does she mm. get the job done does she put people back in her place does she protect her boundaries yeah. and therefore does she keep you safe because that's her role mm. and if she's coming up sure there might be other ways for you to handle that but first off you've got to start from the point of loving that she's there because she comes up to protect you mm. So then the next part for me is once I've done that, then I have a journal and I almost, it's like a investigation journal where I observe when she's come up and I just write those incidences down and I observe how I behaved. So not with judgment, not with blame, not with shame, just observing. It's almost like a trial and error process of, well, I'll try and go a little bit this way to the left and see what happens. And I'll try and go a little bit this way to the right and I'm just going to see what happens. It's almost like a trial and error to see where she, what her boundaries are, where she fits in and Mm. where, where she's in her greatest power. Yes. And sometimes I'm going to nail that and sometimes I'm really not, Mm. but it is always coming back to how does that serve me? What is my altar? So as opposed to sitting in shame, how can I love what it is that she brings Mm. and love the wildish nature within myself. So even when I lose myself or what I consider losing my rational brain and she completely has her way with me and I'm, you know, a firing blazing woman. Well, also how does that serve my seductress and how do I love that? Mm. Because part of me kind of does, I kind of love, you know, that kind of classic, I don't know, Spanish or, you know, Italian woman who just fires up, but you know, it's, 
equally as passionate in her sexiness because she has this ability to yeah. reach her highs and her lows and has total access to that. Mm. And that's what I love about her too. So how do I come to a place of loving her rather than wanting to shame her and disown her because mm. it's never going to work well, is yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's just going to cause conflict in It you. is. Now, coming back to the mother bear energy too, I think it's totally appropriate to be there. But I also like what you said to me, Bridget, which was, one of the reasons she that mama bear is coming up is because I'm perceiving in that moment that what is happening or being done to my child is wrong and yes. will impact them negatively. But what if it doesn't? What if whatever that challenge is for, the, for my child totally serves them? Mm. Do they have to step up? Do they have to get a new toolkit? Do they actually create a void out of that that then makes them scramble and do the opposite in yeah. their adult life? So we're actually is the support in the challenge. And therefore, do I need to ferociously rush in to save them versus allowing them to experience the challenge and grow the way that they're meant to? Well, let's get like analytical here. So rushing in to save them is actually rushing in to save yourself because you're, because something is happening to them in your, in your perception is, is something that happened to you at their age. Right. So because the two of us, my child and I, could experience the same situation and have completely different learnings out of it based on our previous wounds. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So whatever's happening to your child, like that's happening with me at the moment with my son in swimming. So he's reflecting back to me where I was at at that age that he's at. And he's trying to heal my emotions that I have not yet equilibrated from that age. So the same thing is happening to you as a mother when your mum and bear instincts come in, when you find yourself uncomfortable with choices your children are making. They are pushing your own buttons to bring awareness to your own unhealed past or un unbalanced past. And so tr like, you know, true love and, and love without baggage would actually be to have the presence of mind to see how a challenging situation would serve your child mm. and sitting back and allowing that to, tra to to happen. Because the thing is, our children don't benefit from us saving their desperation. Because saving their desperation limits their capacity to grow and trust themselves. Because it's, it's like us, you know, we, we get addicted to the, the person who can, you know, who we perceive can take away our pain, you know, and we um, become infantile in that. And it keeps our children infantile if we remove the pain and the challenge for them. What's wiser is to get them to step up to those challenges, give them the tools to help overcome them themselves mm. or see the benefits and the stuff that was hard for them. Mm. And then that builds resilience. To expand their toolkit, yeah. to give them sentences, tools, empathetic um, breakdowns of that situation. Yeah. As opposed, I mean, we're not just saying you just let them be and, no. you know, fend for themselves. You've, they've got to have toolkits to be able to do that Absolutely. and stepping in at the appropriate time as opposed to something's happened and it's like, bang, bang, I'm right there. Yeah. And just give it a second, mm -hmm. check in about my own feelings and where this wound is for me and just see what happens. If they're struggling, of course, go yeah. in and help them. And, and this, but what this, if they don't? Yeah. But you don't give them the opportunity to, to even try. Because you go and save them. Yeah. And I think so, I mean, so many of us parent on autopilot and don't realize that we are, that our children are giving us an opportunity every day to parent ourselves again. And we can either parent ourselves unconsciously and continue to repattern whatever was painful for us through our children. Or we can go, oh, okay, that's, that's triggering something in me. You know, what is that? And how can I help my child choose their way through this as opposed to me go in and project my stuff and, you know, kind of take away that learning experience mm. for them? You know? I do, totally. It completely makes sense to me. Mm. But I hadn't connected the dots with my mamisma energy because mm. part of that ferociousness of the protecting my kids has, has I don't know, part of, it's my core, one of my core, it was part of my core value yeah, in a way, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So it wasn't until you had said that to me that I had that moment where I went, oh, shit, of course, we're defined so often our greatest successes come from our greatest challenges. Mm. But if I'm constantly not allowing my child the opportunity to deal with challenges, they're never going to have them. Yeah, yeah. So what sort of an adult does that create? Yeah. Or they will, but they'll be not ones that they would choose, you know, that, that, that they will be, that they will be you know, bigger challenges because the more that you try and keep your challenges small and manageable and, you know, like avoid, then you attract bigger ones because our natural thing is to grow and we need both. 
Mm. Um, and you know, it's, it's and you can talk about this in the context of you know, like ridiculous things like you know, not not having winners in certain sporting mm. arrangements because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. I mean, that's crazy. Yes. You know, so it's just about having that presence of mind about, okay, how can this be used as a learning opportunity? And instead of going into immediate reaction mode um, about bl- and blaming the other child or the other parent or them, they're not being responsible enough for their child and their child sent this to my child, how about instead, okay, well, this is a situation. Yeah, we wouldn't choose it. How can we use it as a, as a learning opportunity? How can you practice your tools, you know, as a parent to help your child through some stuff and also get your child to awaken in them their own um, power? Mm. It's like the role of a bully comes in to get the other person being bullied to empower themselves. It's a, it's a natural order. Mm. It's what has to happen in a society to help people grow. So you can't get rid of bullying. It will ha- the bully comes in, bullies someone, person keeps getting bullied until they waken up their own fire and then the bully disappears because the bully's not needed anymore mm. the same can be said for any kind of challenge we face it's getting us to wake up that challenge that conflict is going to keep happening until you get the learnings yeah. and create the change within yourself yeah and then, and then it won't be needed anymore yeah and then you'll just reach a new set of challenges in a different area because yeah. you know you'll, you'll get a moment of you know equilibration and a moment of Feeling pretty, a rest period, a rest period, and yeah. then the next thing will come in, and the volatility of that is proportionate to how much you can balance your perceptions on things, how much you can equilibrate your own passions, mm. and you know, like. So the bigger the conflict, the bigger the drama. Yeah. The bigger you're polarized, one way. The bigger your viewpoint yes. is only one sided. Yes. Yeah, it almost matches it. Yeah. Yeah, I have to love my mama bear a bit more then, don't mm. I? <laughs> <laughs> So we hope there's been some gems of wisdom in this for you to help you see the conflict in your own life from a new perspective and perhaps have some tools to help shift it. Um, and if you want to connect with me, it's at www.suburbansandcastles.com and our next event is in January, which is Awake, the Life of Yogananda, which looks at the introduction of yoga to the Western world in the 1920s and um, I guess how powerful it's been in, in people's awakenings. Um, so that's a pretty pretty exciting one to kick off the year. If you want to connect with Jules, it's at thepleasurenutritionist.com. And you've also got your book coming underway, don't you? I am. I'm really working away at it. So, And I've had a few friends review it and I'm feeling pretty good about it. It's, actually. It's actually. And my blog, I do, I am, my website isn't 100% finished, it's 80% done, but it is still up there and I am posting on the blog. I noticed your blog posts, I was loving them. I got to re- read a few. And Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Oh. I can't, wait, I can't wait to see the book. I've had a little bit of a glimpse of your book, but I'm looking forward to hear, seeing wow, how it, thanks, how it evolves. Wow, thanks, that. Um, and if you'd like to connect with Nourishing the Mother, it's at facebook.com forward slash Nourishing the Mother. And we've also um, got planning well and truly underway for our next retreat. So we really invite you to consider... Um, perhaps joining us on that retreat, which is looking like it's going to be in March. And so this we'll time have... of year, gifting yourself or someone else that you love an experience that could literally shift your life. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, we're really going to slow things down in this retreat and give time for um, integration. Integration and into your life, your meaning your challenges and learnings out of it. Yeah, and because we really feel like that these podcasts offer the most when we can workshop something, yes. you know, and see how the concepts that we talk about can apply to a real life situation. And so we want to offer the women in our retreat an opportunity to have some of their own stuff workshopped. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's just such gifts in that to then be able to really see. And gifts for everyone, gifts in like learning from their stories as much as they're learning from their stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you're enjoying our podcasts and there's one in particular that's calling to you, please share it on social media and email it to your friends or whatever it is that you think someone could have some learnings out of. And if you're on iTunes, please pop onto our podcast and rate us because it does help us keep going on iTunes. And we will see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. We hope you enjoyed this Wellness Catch podcast brought to you by Audible. Do you find that you just don't have time to read all the awesome books that you hear mentioned on The Wellness Couch? Well, Audible might just have the answer. Audible is offering The Wellness Couch listeners a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can get books like Eat Right for Your Blood Type, Why We Get Fat by Gary Torbs, Paleo Diet for Athletes, or even The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. So to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com 
forward slash the wellness couch. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash the wellness couch for your free audiobook. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.